Uh, my name is Lyle Perman. I'm a rancher from Lowry, South Dakota, which is in north cent the north central part of the state. Well, people are going to hear a little bit of story of the history of our uh, ranch, uh, of my ancestors, and the various enterprises that we have within our ranch. Uh, sheep, cattle, and within the cattle enterprise, we've got stockers, we've got yearling heifers that we breed, we've got spring cow calving pairs. Um, so that's just a and then some of the things that we've done right and some of the things that we've done wrong. Well, uh, one of the things that we did uh, this past year is we've diversified by adding another species, and that being sheep, uh, rotational grazing. Uh, we've also added uh, a hunting enterprise uh, to our ranch. And then the other story that, of a ranch is the transition from uh, uh, I'm the fourth generation, from the fifth generation, and hopefully the sixth. Well, the message is important because uh, Really, the story we have to tell is what we're doing uh, to make, first of all, to make a living as a family, but secondly, to make a positive impact on our ecosystem. Anyway, I want to start out by introducing my wife, Garnet. Um, I can tell you that uh, we would not be where we are today without the help of my wife, Garnet. So uh, I really appreciate what she brings to the table. Um, she's the brains of the operation. My son is at home running the business, and I can just show up here and, and talk about it. Uh, but that's, that's part of our goal as a family, is what we've learned, what Garnet and I have learned, and the mistakes we've made. Hopefully, we can pass that on to the next generation. And, and so uh, that's, that's really what we're all about. So our mission is to reflect Christ and how we love people manage the land and care for its inhabitants, both domestic and wild. I used to use a, a little bit different picture, but it rained this year, can you tell? So we got a new ranch picture that we'd like to use. Uh, this is our family, it's, uh, it's about a year old, we've added one more to it. Our seven grandchildren on this picture are all above average. And uh, our son Luke and his wife, here's Luke and his wife Naomi, are on the ranch with us as well as there are two sets of twins, and then our, our daughter, Kaisa, and her son, Chris. They live uh, near Nashville, uh, Franklin, Tennessee, and they've got four children. And so anyway, we spend uh, a couple of times a year. We fly down to Nashville and spend some time down there. It's not vacation because they live on an acreage outside of town, and I build fence and I remodel buildings and uh, do all kinds of outside work when I'm down there. And so it's, it's really, it's enjoyable getting away, but it's not a, a vacation like a lot of us think or would think it would be. Our ranch is not that far from here. We're 90 miles north of our state capital and pier, 140 miles south of here, not too far from Mobridge. So it, it's really not that far. Uh, we get up here quite often. Uh, Occasionally, my wife comes up for shopping, but most of the time it's to the airport on 1804 uh, that we come up because it is one of our better connections uh, as far as flights are concerned. So our ranch has changed. I, I told our son, if you keep things the same, there's an opportunity uh, to bring another member of your family and it might not be real good. Uh, so you need to be looking at making changes. and. I probably should have never told him that because the changes he's made have kept me busier than I want to be. One of the things he did is add acres, and when you add acres, then you got to figure out how you're going to cover those acres. But a ranch today is about 12,000 acres, of which 90% is grass, 10% crop. We have about 1,200 animal units that we're capable of uh, carrying on there. And the rainfall might be a little bit more than here, but not a lot. Uh, normal is about 17 inches, and this year we're, we're going to hit 30 inches of moisture before the end of the year. Uh, 90 of it so far was in the form of snow, and uh, I'm ready for a drought. I don't know about the rest of you, but I didn't think I'd ever say that, but I am shoveling snow another winter is something I, I could do without. One of the things that's interesting, we've done a little bit of work on, our, on where we live. Our watershed is it's easy to remember 369, but it's 368,842 acres. And about 40% is cropland and 60% is grassland. And uh, so anyway, that in, in some ways, that, that's created some problems that I'll talk about. 
I've had four sets of great-grandparents that, that homesteaded within 30 minutes of where I live. This is a picture of my great-grandfather on Main Street of Lowry with the first tractor that came into our region in 1917. This is my grandpa. And so uh, I grew up in a, in a household that knows all about dumplings and, and strudels and, and kuchen. And, and uh, so anyway, my dad didn't know English until... Uh, he started, was about ready to start school as his brother came home and my grandparents said, we've got to start talking more English so that the kids can succeed in life. And so anyway, uh, Germans from Russia is my heritage on my dad's side of the family. My mom's side of the family, I learned how to eat lutefisk and lefse this time of year. So anyway, uh, uh, as a result, there was not any German spoken in our house because my mom didn't understand a word of it. Uh, this is uh, Garnet 9, 1976. And those of you that are our age, we're, we're both 65 this year, know what the early 80s were like. And so we had, we had uh, some, a pretty good start after we got married, some decent years, but the 80s were not real kind. We paid high interest. We saw low prices for our commodities, high prices for land. Some years are too wet, some years are too dry. And I've got in there master versus apprentice. Do you know what the difference is between the two? The master's made more mistakes. And so I can tell you that I've made my fair share of mistakes in my lifetime. Getting married to Garnet was not one of them. So our, our operation has made uh, our primary uh, animal is uh, spring calving cows. And uh, we start calving towards the end of April. We like to minimize our labor when, when as a ranch grew, being able to take care of cows in inclement weather was something that became very undesirable, especially with the kind of numbers we are starting to run. And so we've, we went from calving in March, that's what I did growing up and even when I started in the business, to calving now, like I said, towards the end of April. And we, have, we run two groups of cows, our young cows, which are our first and second calvers, and our old cows. Our old cows we breed to Angus, and our young cows, we breed, uh, I'll show you in just a minute, we breed into two Japanese breeds. And then as far as our yearlings are concerned, we've got two types of yearlings we operate. We have a stocker operation where we custom graze yearlings uh, for an entity. But we're, we're part owners of those steers that are within that group. And then uh, we've got uh, yearling heifers also. The yearling heifers we breed for 30 days and uh, either 20, between 28 and 30 days. And yes, we have opens. But what we want to do is we want to find out, you know, who's the most fertile. And it's usually plenty of, uh, there's usually plenty of them that are bred for us. So if we breed, we probably breed 90%. There's 10% we don't want to bring into the herd. And so those, if they are bred, we will uh, treat them with a hormone and, and uh, abort the fetus. Uh, but um, most of the time, those, they don't breed anyway because for one reason or another, they, they just aren't fertile. But anyway, so that's the yearling part of it. Our grazing season, we do plan on grazing in the wintertime. Uh, we do have stored feed, primarily for emergencies and for animals that we do keep in confinement. And hopefully that's not very many for very long. But there are times when we need the stored feed. Primary source of grazing in the wintertime is crop aftermath and cover crops. You saw a cover crops picture there with the yearlings we had. Uh, we will run cows and uh, especially young cows uh, on our cover crops and our calves that we're overwintering. So with our calves that we, that we do wean, our Angus calves, they're still on the cow and they will probably stay on the cow until, unless the weather gets really bad, most of the winter. And because they're all gonna go back on grass next summer, uh, we, our primary crop that we grow on our ranch is, is grass. And so how do we add value to it? By putting pounds on cattle. And uh, we don't like to feed them any more grain than possible. And so the calves will overwinter part of the winter on the cows. So ones that we're weaning right now are the ones that are our Wagyu Akushi crosses. And we'll try and, and wean them actually uh, today and tomorrow. My son is weaning those. And this is how we wean. This is one of our weaning pens. Uh, we lock the cows up and leave the calves in the pasture that uh, they were in the night before. So the cattle that he weaned today, uh, they, he put them in that pasture last night. It's right near uh, the headquarters where I live. My son lives four miles away. 
and he's got the stockers that he's starting to accumulate over there, and there's pasture between the two of us that he'll wean the second group uh, there. But we lock the cows up for uh, usually two days, sometimes three, and the calves adjust to the weaning process a lot quicker than the cows do. The cows do not like being locked up, especially when they get what I feed them, which isn't very good hay compared to the grass that they have been used to grazing. And then after 48 hours or sometimes uh, a little bit longer, maybe uh, 72 hours, we'll, uh, we'll trail them away and uh, then that's pretty well the end of the story. In, in our travels, one of the places that we've gone to has been uh, Germany and Hungary. We've got friends there. And so, yeah, we do some of the tourist things, see all the beautiful places in Budapest and in Dresden and, and uh, places like that. But uh, we spend a lot of time uh, with them. Um, and uh, so we get, to, we get to live with them. We get to go in the country if they farm. We go on their farms. If they're in a hunting club, we go on their hunting club. But these two pictures uh, Garnet took of me at Flau on Flower Island, which is in the, in the Bodensee in Germany, the largest freshwater body in Germany and the third largest in Europe. And we paid good money to take a uh, ride on a boat uh, out to this island. Uh, and the two plants that I'm pointing to with my thumb down are wormwood and leafy spurge. And... Uh, you know, the two, of, two of the weeds that, that really give us uh, sleepless nights. I thought it was interesting, and, I, and, you know, they have signs out there saying, you don't pick the ornamentals. You know, if you want to go to jail, pick them. I just had to bend the stem on that leafy spurge to see, is this really leafy spurge? Because it sure looks like it. I thought the interesting thing about it, though, the translation in English for the name for leafy spurge was wolf's milk. And so I thought any of you that know what leafy spurge is, you'll understand why it's called wolf smell. So we've tried a couple of things in our ranch on some what we consider noxious weeds for bi biological control. We've released uh, flea beetles and stem weevils. Flea beetles on the leafy spurge, stem weevils on the Canadian thistle, and really haven't had the kind of results we were hoping to. We, we were hoping it'd, be, it'd, it'd uh, accelerate or we'd see a better results sooner. And so, uh, and I'm not saying we expected it in a year or two, but we probably have uh, been, had both of those uh, particular pests uh, or insects released, uh, you know, probably seven or eight years ago. And uh, anyway, we, we really weren't getting the kind of results that we hoped to. I also spent a little bit of time uh, trying to uh, train our cattle to eat western snowberry. And what I found is it's pretty easy in a dry lot because that's where you have to train them. It's pretty easy in a dry lot to get them to eat it. If you don't recognize what, West, what western snowberry is, it's also called buckbrush. And we have got an abundant supply of it in our ranch, um, more, more than the, the range sites should have. And anybody that's familiar with what a range site should look at, look like, would, if they came to our ranch, they'd say, wow, yeah, you do have a little bit more buckbrush than you probably should have. And it historically has bothered us, but not anymore. Our cattle do consume it, uh, especially this time of year. They really like the berries. Uh, but for the most part, we don't consider it as much of a factor as I probably did 20 years ago. And it's got a lot to do with how we're managing it. Uh, but we did make a change this year. The drawback, the thing that's kept me from doing what you're seeing there, bringing sheep into our enterprise, was fences. Really were concerned about fences. And so the, the, the people that own the sheep that were custom grazing for, uh, one of the drawbacks was when I looked at two-tenths of an AUM for a sheep for a ewe versus one AUM for a cow, and they told us what they'd be willing to pay us, uh, the math just didn't work. Um, and then, of course, you can see they pretty well were free range. Well, it didn't take us long to figure out that free range sheep, even with a shepherd and, and uh, herding dogs, was, uh, uh, wasn't quite the answer because he could have been on this side of the hill and some sheep could have been on the other side of the hill, and the next thing you know, some of the sheep maybe disappeared over a draw and he didn't see them. Because where we're located on a ranch, it is called Rock Hills Ranch for a reason. It's very similar to this, it's River Hills. And so it didn't take us long to realize that we had to do something a little bit different with the sheep. So this is a picture of, of Jesus, um, the Good Shepherd. That's what we call him. If you, if you don't know what, how Jesus is spelled in 
Spanish, it's J-E-S-U-S. And if you know your Bible, you'll understand. So we call him Jesus the Good Shepherd. And so there are a couple of things we really like about sheep that it didn't take us long to figure out. One is their diet is different than cattle. Not entirely, but they do consume more forbs than cattle do. And so, you know, you talk about diversity, and we knew that the sheep could be, uh, their diet could be different than cattle. But what we didn't recognize prior to us bringing them are some of the other advantages to having sheep. Number one, even when you do have the sheep on a free range, they tend to be bunched. If you put, and in our case right now, we've got 1,800 sheep uh, on the ranch. And uh, if you turned 1,800 sheep loose on a, on a quarter of grass, you'll find that most of those sheep are going to be in the same general area, probably within 20 acres. But if you turn this, the equivalent loose of, of beef cattle, they're going to cover every corner, unless, unless it's a real hot day and they go into the wind. And so they tend to be more of a herd animal than, than cattle do. And then the other thing, like I said, is their diet. We really noticed that their diet was more different than cattle than what we thought they'd be. So you can see what we figured out after, we, after we, one day one of the neighbors called from two miles away and said, I've got 250 ewes. You wouldn't happen to know who they belong to. And I said, yeah, I know who they belong to. So anyway, what we figured out is we've got to use polynetting. We use polynetting. We can find them to two acres, and uh, you can see where they're at there. This is a pen that's subdivided. This is absolutely the worst place that we've got in our ranch with leafy spurge. It's where we release flea beetles, and the stand is pretty dense. They pretty well have defoliated what you see on the right-hand side, and what we learned is they even get tired of leafy spurge. Uh, but on the left-hand side, those sheep will get turned into that on the left-hand side of your screen later in that day, and by the next day, it'll look just like the stuff on the right side did. So do we hope to eliminate it? Probably it will never happen. But you see, it's a plant in our ranch that was a liability for us. Because even today, we still spray. And we spray because, because we feel we need to. There's small patches of it that are establishing in other locations not far away. And the vector tends to be uh, either birds or mule deer that move it. And so we just felt we needed to uh, address the small patches and then use something other than flea beetles to try and control it where it's more dense. This is what they do to wormwood. We found it pretty interesting, and I should have probably put western snowberry and Canadian thistle in, and maybe I'll get some pictures of that next year. But they don't completely defoliate wormwood, which kind of surprised me. I thought they'd probably do a little bit better job of defoliating that than what they do. But uh, it was the leafy spurge. You, if you didn't know what it was, if you went out there and you knew that there's leafy spurge in that area, and you went out and you took a look at it, you wouldn't know it's leafy spurge when they get done with it, unless it's a real dense patch like I showed you in one of the earlier slides. That is completely defoliated. And it's going to be interesting to see in some of those areas where it wasn't so dense that the sheep worked. Uh, if, we, if we turn a, a herd and, and have them, we did. We brought a group to our place and had them graze through some leafy spurge, a small patch, uh, probably this big around, and just had them graze through it. And as they approached it, what we found is there's just some sheep that saw it. And immediately when they saw it, from probably 20 feet away, they walked over to it and started eating on it. And it was pretty interesting. The, the thing that we noticed, too, is the breed of sheep that we're running is something that's a little bit different. They're haired sheep. And they use them because uh, of a longer breeding season. Those ewes uh, have been lambing already, whereas your normal wool breeds will, probably won't start lambing until December. These they can breed earlier. So we got used without lambs, and uh, he thought that they probably worked pretty well uh, with uh, the leafy spurge, and I guess we were well satisfied with what they did. So what did we have to invest in to bring sheep into our operation? Well, I, I bought a, an old portable ice fishing shack and remodeled it, and we pulled it around for a place for him to get out of the elements during the day. We got uh, a herder, a four-wheeler, Remy is the dog, Jesus is our shepherd, and a thousand ewes is where we started, and right now... Uh, we're a little over a thousand ewes. The 
Some of the ewes have gone home because they're bred and they're lambing, and they've replaced them with lambs. We did have a, somewhat of an issue. The guard dogs came with them, and the guard, we got four guard dogs that are with the sheep. But there's a few things we had to learn with the guard dogs. We've got uh, their great Pyrenees. I also bought a portable loading chute for sheep that's come in real handy when the semi comes and you've got to get that top deck of your regular cattle chute doesn't work real well. This is just an example or one of the areas that we, we were running them also. So they move them twice a day basically. So right now they're in their night pen and uh, tomorrow morning they'll of course they'll still be in the night pen but then at, over the noon hour once a day whether it's July or November he moves them to the water pen and while they're in the water pen he rebuilds his pen for what the, where the sheep are going to go for the next 20 hours. And uh, what I like about it is short duration, high intensity, their diet is different than our cattle, and where they're at today, we'll probably treat that area for maybe a couple of years because it's one of the problems we've been having is with our deferment and are trying to build up residue, uh, we're getting encroachment of plants we don't like, smooth brome in particular. And that's a real problem for us. Are you, are you seeing some of the same problems here in North Dakota with smooth brome? Well, with a sheep, if you put up a polywire fence, guess what? You're going to eat it or you're not going to get anything. So that's what they're on right now. And we'll probably put them back on there next year about the 1st of June. Because you can't have your cattle every place at the same time. With our sheep, we can treat some of those areas that we really want to feel we need, we need treatment with. So this is a water pen they're currently operating in. That's just a spring-fed creek that we've got on a part of our ranch. And they'll be there till the end of this week, and then we'll move them to a different spot. What I really, one of the things I really like about sheep, of course, they're in a pen here, but when they weren't in a pen is our cattle tend to be lazier than sheep. Sheep don't mind steep slopes. Cattle do. And so for find our, finding the sheep grazing on a slope was not... Uh, uncommon. We did learn that guard dogs do like chicken. We have free-range chickens in our yard, and I asked the people that own the guard dogs when the sheep came. The semis came in with the dogs on the, on the truck. I said, what are your dogs, what do they do around chickens? And of course, the sheep were in our yard, and the chickens were in our yard, and the dogs, he said, I really don't know, but they weren't bothering them. Well, the next morning when I woke up, we had dead chickens. We didn't have any live chickens. What I found out is the chickens were fast enough that they fled to the parts of our pasture where there's plenty of hung, uh, grass. And by the end of the week, about, I don't know, probably two-thirds of them came back. But anyway, guard dogs do like chicken. The sheep water requirements, I got to thinking about it. Uh, they drink about a gallon of water a day. I got to thinking about where sheep are in the United States. They tend to be in the west, especially the desert southwest. And there's a reason for that. You read in the Bible, it talks about sheep in the Middle East. One of the obstacles we've got in our ranch is water, just like most of you. But what we liked about it is the fact that one gallon a day, no matter how hot it is, so per AUM, their requirements for water are not what cattle are. And so we really appreciated the fa that fact. Uh, one thing I'll point out here, this is typically what you see for a guard dog. There's four of them, but they might be here uh, they're usually on their edges. There's one of them that's usually in the middle. They usually come and greet you. We don't like to pet or play with them. But uh, uh, we've learned, too, to train them. If they, if they do leave the herd, you just shoot with a shotgun. The owner says when he trains them initially, once, one time we shoot with the gun to, shotgun to get them to go back where they belong with the sheep. The second time we shoot with the gun to get them back to go with the sheep, and the third time we shoot the dog. Because a dog that does not stay with sheep is a problem. And where they come from, their people are more densely populated and they just don't want them leaving. So I was really concerned uh, we had some of them leave and they were gone for four days. And I called him and told him about it. And he said, well, if they're a problem, don't worry about it. If they don't come back, they wouldn't come back here. Training them to respect electric fences was a challenge. As a matter of fact, we got 187 more lambs last night while I'm here. We keep them in a small pen in the yard, a sheep-type tight fence for lambs, and train them to electric fence before we introduce them to the herd. Otherwise, we learn the hard way. They knock the poly wire, poly netting fence down, and, and it isn't just 187 that are gone it's 1,700 that are gone. And then that can be a problem because, it, because we do have neighbors with soybeans about a half mile away. 
And if they'd have 1,200 head or 1,500 head of sheep in their soybean field, I'm thinking my phone would ring. Like I said, the, the other thing that those sheep have got to learn to is because when they come to our place, they don't know what a Great Pyrenees is, and that can scoop, spook them too. So there's been some challenges this year. So shifting gears a little bit, now I'm going to show you a little, some of the things I've learned and some of the changes we've made in our ranch. In 2014, late in 2014, we bought this property. Uh, it's been season-long grazed for a long time. And this is a repairing area. Uh, we talked about 369,000 acre watershed. This is a creek that drains the watershed. And so bottom line is this is a common site of these areas, which you see them all over in our state. We see these white spots, saline seeps, and they just never go away. So the first thing I did that year in 2015 is I built this fence. And these are yearlings right here that they can't have access to this creek. Not in this pasture, but they do get access to it. We, we fully utilize this area. So we built that fence to keep them out of there during the growing season. This is three years later, picture taken from the same spot. And you can see that was last summer. No, in 18. That's the vegetation growing there on both sides. This picture I just took yesterday morning. And what's happening is, is, of course, the first thing that comes in is plants that are salt tolerant. And the next thing that comes in are plants that are salt tolerant that, cause, because a wild foxtail is now being displaced by western wheatgrass, slender wheatgrass, wheatgrasses that our animals will consume. And why is that happening? Because I remove cattle during a sensitive time of year. And a lot of these issues that we're seeing can be solved if we allow nature to do it. I didn't do anything other than remove cattle during the growing season. That's all I did. And uh, what's interesting is across the road, probably 200 yards away, is a soybean field with the same problem. And Roundup kills everything except that growing plant. So guess what? He's still got a problem. And it hasn't changed because the plants that can tolerate what to solve the problem aren't allowed to grow. And I'm just telling you, there are solutions to it in nature if we just allow nature to do its job. This is a repairing area uh, that was created because uh, our predecessors didn't know how to manage. They didn't know any better. When they came here, uh, heavy tillage is what they did. And so that creek bottom was formed after this area was settled. And uh, it's anywhere from 10 feet deep and 30 feet wide, and it gets real shallow by the time it gets to our yard. But uh, we've been able to heal it. As a matter of fact, when we bought our ranch and moved on there in 1976, and then I bought it three years later from my parents, the creek, as it ran through our yard, we could still see the tops of the cars that they put down in there. That's what they used to do to solve erosion problems. I'm sure others of you have seen people just fill it with junk. And that's what it is, old cars. Anyway, we didn't throw any old, any old cars in, but the key is time and timing, time and timing. You can heal a repairing area with the length of time you utilize it and the time of year that it's utilized. Um, this is a, I give talks about water, and so I've shown you just a little bit of a couple of slides earlier about a repairing area. This is a, also another story about our watershed. This is a Swan Creek that I talked about. It flows through this area here, the Swan Creek bottom, and this picture was taken. It's an old uh, USDA picture uh, of Section 5 of 121.75, of which we own quite a bit of that now. But anyway, back in the day, everybody had about 40 acres, and you can see it. Here's one, 40, two, this one's 60, this one's 80, here's another one. Dump raked. Mowed, sickle mowed, dump raked, used a bucker and made stacks. Anybody, anybody else in here ever seen that or done that? Sure. All right, so everybody did it. And it's what I did as a kid growing up. Well, probably starting about 20 years ago, and by the way, when we were, when we were haying it, this picture is only about 15 years old. When we were haying it, we'd get two and a half ton of the acre off of it. But here's what started to happen. This is a picture this year. And people are saying, what is going on? Yeah, we've had a lot of rain, but this isn't the first year that that hay ground looks like this. This is not the first year. So instead of being able to mow it and rake it and stack it like we historically did and get our predominant grasses 
as a kid growing up on that ground was western wheatgrass and we'd get some prairie, some prairie cord grass, but just about no uh, other water tolerant plants like, like cattails or bulrushes, nothing like that. And this is what it's turned into. Now, if we're dry enough long enough, we have introduced some other water tolerant plants in there like Garrison Creeping Foxtail and Reed's Canary. But for the most part, the days of um, western wheatgrass growing on any of that, they're gone. So this is what it looks like today as I speak. So what has happened? Just to give you a little bit of an idea, SDSU did some research on our ranch from, from 2006 to 2012. And that 368,842 acres, 21,000 acres were converted. And if you want to know how land use impacts water, just look at a rainfall simulator sometime. I'm assuming that a lot of you have seen it, and if you haven't, Google one. Rainfall simulator. Look it up on the internet so you can learn. Jay can tell you all about it. So and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the developments we've got on our, on our ranch. This right here is a typical watering system. That box has got a pipe in it that goes six foot down into the ground, and warm air comes up and keeps the float from freezing and keeps the water line from freezing. The only thing that will freeze with this current setup is the surface itself. But if you have enough animals drinking, it's not a problem. Most of our tanks are 10 to 12 foot in diameter. Uh, my son got tired of the wooden part, and so he told his dad, you've got to come up with something that doesn't deteriorate. And I said, well, anything I build, is, I'm not going to have to worry about. It should last. And that's, what, that's where he's got a problem. So I built a form, and this, this takes about 900 pounds of concrete, and I dropped that over the, drop, drop that over there. So there's the riser pipe that we set it over, and I build a, a wooden lid for it, which it'll be fine because it's not in the water. Uh, so that's the pipe. One of the things we learned is when you got a pipe and you don't cover it, the raccoons like to go down. So we, I had to build something, and that's a real problem. When they, when they uh, damage that pipe, they don't damage it near the top. <laughs> It's six foot down, and you got to dig and get under the slab, and it's, it's a royal pain. One of the other things that my son, uh, I always tell people, uh, I'll talk a little bit about son Luke. Some of you know who he is. He graduated from college in 2006 and, and came back, got married, and joined the operation at that time. He likes to try new things just like I did. And some of the things we like, I like to talk about because they were a success, and some of the things that, you know, I shake my head about. But one of the things he did that, that I thought was really good is he installed, uh, this is a camera, and usually we install these in places that are far enough away from home that we don't want to go up and check them every day. And of course, this is a time of year where we're concerned about them freezing. So let's see once, by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, do we have to go shop ice. The name of the company, if you want to look it up, is called Barnall. And this is the picture that that camera will take, and it'll tell you the temperature. That was 4 degrees Fahrenheit. And, of course, they're drinking without a problem. That was last November. And this is a picture that it sends. He doesn't send it to me anymore. He just sends it to his phone. He must figure I'm not going to respond anyway. So why send it to Dad? But anyway, uh, I think it costs him like $15 a month for two phones. Uh, and so he's got the camera on there, and, and it sends him the pictures, and for what he pays for it, it definitely pays its way in terms of, you know, wondering what the con situation is for this particular location. We do uh, use a lot of uh, above-ground pipeline, and we've learned that we got to bury just a little bit, so I made a plow for the front of our skid steer. That's 200 PSI, inch and a half of uh, pipeline. And we like to bury a little bit of close to the tank and then close to the source just to keep it from moving because if we don't, the water line tends to move. So that's just me plowing in a little bit of line. This is something we bought this year. You know, one of the issues we deal with is watering calves and sheep. And what kind of water tank do you have that you can water calves and sheep and yet still water your cows? So we bought two types of tanks. Uh, this one here uh, holds 2,300 gallons. And then uh, the smaller one holds about 1,200 and they're just like a big chicken water. There's a float near the top on the other side, then there's fill hose will fill from the top, and then there's a float down here underneath this enclosure that has got a valve on it that fills the perimeter. This right here is a skid steer attachment, and any tractor you buy today, at least most of the good companies, other than, I shouldn't say, other than John Deere, but John Deere thinks they got the best attachment. Um, 
set up, but maybe they've even gone with their small tractors and their loader set, but they come with a skid steer plate, the smaller equipped tractors do today too. So we've got actually two tractors and a skid steer that we can move these tanks with, and so that's pretty handy. We just set them on one of our flatbed pickups and move them around if we want to. Uh, so sometimes with our solar setup we do, sometimes we've got existing water tanks that have got a hydrant near them too, and so it just can increase our capacity and give calves something to to access as well as the cows. One of the things that our, my son Luke built too was uh, he took a uh, tractor tire, not a tractor tire, that one I think is a tire off the front of a spreader, fertilizer spreader, and he cut a hole in it, put some well stem pipe through it, and uh, this hole right here is where the ingredients come out of. This is a flatbed pickup. They hold about 800 pounds and he can carry two of them. And so that's what it looks like when you distribute it. Pretty inexpensive way to repurpose something and make a feeder out of it. He laid in about 100 ton of dried distillers this spring, not this spring, this summer. We're close enough to plants that sometimes the train doesn't come when it's supposed to. And so they'll call and say, hey, uh, we've got a deal on dried distillers if you're interested. So you usually can get it right now. It's, he probably bought it. He bought it for $100 a ton. I haven't checked lately, but I'm sure it's over 150 a ton right now. Um, so he saves quite a bit, and it's something he uses anyway. And at the cost of distillers, we're not too concerned about waste. It's a, it comes in a meal form versus other sources like cake, which utilization will be higher. But if you buy it enough cheaper, you don't worry about utilization. So I talked a little bit about change. These are the two breeds of, of bulls that Luke introduced, and they're strictly terminal. Their flight zone is different than our Angus, which means you don't have to get as close to them to get them to move. Are, do we worry about them as far as uh, being aggressive towards humans? No, uh, but they just move a little bit quicker. So you just... Old guys like me maybe have a harder time getting out of the way. Uh, we do lease out most of our ranch to the state of South Dakota for, for hunting, and it tends to be big game, the, and we'll house some people in our shop actually starting this week. Uh, we also have a pheasant hunting enterprise that's unguided. Uh, we house them also. We've taken our farm shop and made some living quarters in it, so we'll house pheasant hunters and archery and rifle deer hunters uh, on the shop. Primary species is mule deer, although we do have whitetail in our cropping area. Uh, mule deer tends to be what most of them are most interested in. One of the other things that, uh, if you're interested in, got a brochure up here called the 100th Meridian Trail, and it's a brochure that my wife Garnet designed. What I did is uh, <clears throat> we've identified 10 locations on a ranch that, that are of importance, and those locations will, could all be destroyed if we converted our native prairies to cropping. And there are things like teepee rings, an eagle catch pit. Have anybody ever heard of an eagle catch pit? Well, we think we've identified four of them on our ranch. 400 years ago, those that were uh, preceded us, that lived in, on, on our ranch, uh, eagle feathers were their currency. Well, if you don't have a gun, have you ever tried to shoot an eagle with a bow and arrow? So what they would do is they'd actually dig a, a pit uh, at the top of a butte and, uh, and lay in the pit and camouflage the pit so they couldn't see that there was a human under it. And then they'd bait it with uh, a stuffed rabbit or a piece of dead meat. And when the eagle landed, they would, they would catch the eagle by hand. And so uh, that's, for example, that's, that's some of the sites, teepee rings, eagle catch pits, uh, trees, flame shacks, uh, wagon trails. And so anyway, we created a brochure. If anybody is interested in what we have in our ranch, you're welcome to come up and take a look at it. So we've got, uh, we've got the 100th Meridian Trail. And by the way, it's called the 100th Meridian Trail because our ranch is on the 100th Meridian. It bisects it. Garnet actually even writes a, a column for a local newspaper called On the 100th Meridian. And one of my goals in life is to create things for her to write about, which... I'd say about once a month I do. We also work pretty hard at trying to reduce our carbon footprint as much as possible. We feed on the ground where the hay is harvested. I recently had somebody came, come into our yard that sells, it's, the company's called Sioux Automation. They sell fence line feeding systems, manure handling systems, that sort of thing. He drove in our yard, he rolled the window down in his pickup, told me why he was there, and he said, but I, I don't think you could use anything I've got to sell. And I said, you're right. 
We, we, like, we like the fecal material to be out in an area where we don't spend any money getting it there. So this is where we, uh, how we try and feed is pretty well out in our hay ground. Although some of our stored hay is in a remote enough location, not enough protection, and we do need some close to home as the snow gets too deep. So we can't say that about all our hay. We're in our seventh year of having interns, and uh, we, we try and equip them so that when they re-enter life, paying, uh, or re-enter society as, as a paying member, as a contributing member, other than as a child or as a student, that they know something about production agriculture. So we'll teach them about everything from grazing management to dung beetles to what's the value of a pocket gopher or what's the value of a coyote. Uh, try and give them the holistic view of managing the land that, that we've learned. The other message that I think is really important is our cattle deliver an ecosystem service. And so we know with our native prairie, we can make a positive impact on cleaner air, cleaner water, and healthier soil. And that's an important message that those of us that are in production agriculture, an important story that, that we have got to be willing to tell. On our ranch, we also have bees. Uh, this particular person that you see here They've got 90,000 hives. It's the largest apiary in the United States, and we've got three of their bee yards on our ranch. Uh, I wouldn't advise you to do what he's doing <laughs> unless you know what you're doing. Uh, but it's really fun to talk to Brett Aidy and have him tell you about bees. If you've never had, as a matter of fact, I don't, think, I don't know that Aidy's come to North Dakota, but I would tell you if you're looking for ideas for speakers, get somebody that operates an apiary to come and talk to you about bees and what they're seeing happen. Of course, you all know about the monarch butterfly and you all know about bumblebees. As a matter of fact, the rusty patch bumblebee is, I believe, is it endangered now or just threatened? But, you know, they, those of you that have cut hay, have you ever run into a bumblebee patch with a, lawn, with a sycamore, Daryl? Okay, well, one thing you find out, if you hit a bumblebee patch with a sycamore, bumblebees fly about two miles an hour faster than an open cab tractor can go. You know that too? Yeah. And, and when you hit them with the sickle mower, if you're not very smart, you'll also hit them with the rake. But I was smart enough to know where to, what to avoid. We've also got native birds on our ranch. I'm sure a lot of you recognize them. And I've got, I've got brochures, but I also got a, a book here, Pocket Guide to Northern Birds. There's over, not, over, over 90 birds that are identified in this, in this book. Some are coarse wetland birds, but most of them are upland prairie birds. And when you lose your prairie, you lose your grasslands, you lose habitat for birds like you're seeing here. And again, like I mentioned, our cattle deliver an eco service, uh, ecosystem service, and of course the sheep also do. And I think it's important for those of us that have animals on the landscape to make sure and tell that story. I've had people recently uh, challenge those of us uh, and I usually respond in an email, it's a lot of times it's people I know, about the, the consumption of beef. And of course they paint the consumption of beef as being a problem, making a negative contribution towards climate change. And I always remind them, I said, maybe you need to start with the people in India that, whose cows don't deliver an ecosystem service like ours do. Because if you remove the cattle from our ranch, it's got, what's it going to be replaced with? Are we going to till it? Are we going to let the, the grasses just go and create a, a, a litter mat that, that then is, is occupied by smooth brome? And if you don't believe me, I can show you where that's happened in our area. Uh, is that really what you want? And the problem is it's, their idea is, is one size fits all. And so we've got to be prepared to challenge and understand what, what you know, how to answer those kind of challenges that face our industry when people think that we need to eat less beef to solve our climate change issues. So our goal at Rock Hills Ranch is to convert solar energy into products for human consumption profitably while making a positive impact on our ecosystem. And that key, that, that's prof, that word profitably is extremely important because if there's no profit in it, it's hard to get other people interested in doing it. Because listen, at the end of the day, we've got a family to feed and we've got a mortgage to pay. And so we've got to make sure that when we're advocating, no matter what it is, that, that the potential for profit is there. Go to our website if you want to learn more about our ranch. You'll also see that if you go uh, and, and Google flagship farmers, we're a flagship farmer for McDonald's. And uh, 
that's a hamburger joint. And anyway, um, you, can, you can see a little bit of story about it there. I've also got some of these stickers here, and I saw one of them back over here on a, on a, a little flask. But if you're interested, I've got some stickers that say, Love the Prairies, Thank a Rancher. So if you're interested, you can, you can take them back too. But that's really important. If, if you love the prairies, it's really important that you thank a rancher, especially one that knows what they're doing. Okay. Any questions for Lyle? I have a couple. So when is the sensitive time of year on that alkali patch for that salt? Does it vary from year to year? Or? As far as when to put cattle on? Right. Well, I can tell you right now what we do is the ground's froze. Because we don't want them in the water either. We put them on when it's froze. So they'll go on. Right now, if you, if you drove by there, we graze it real early this spring. And then just for a short time. But if you drove by, you'll see that we haven't had any. And it's not a big area. But it's an area that we can winter cattle. Because what I've done is I've built wind break, wind break there and developed the water there so I can water in the wintertime. And so we use it 100% utilization. Uh, how do we keep our remaining uh, grasslands uh, for in the northern plains in general? How do, we, how do we? How do we keep our northern grasslands? Salt on our grasslands. How do we? Being converted to oh, how do we keep it from being converted? Well, I'm going to. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to give a commercial right now for something we're doing in South Dakota. Um, I'm the president of the South Dakota Agland Trust, and in South Dakota, perpetual easements. Uh, are viewed similar to what they are in North Dakota, not well liked. Uh, but we decided that, you know, there's probably in South Dakota at any one time, there's never less than 500 applications for perpetual easements to U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And of course, NRCS also has offered easements, some perpetual. So the South Dakota Grassland Coalition, the South Dakota Farm Bureau, the South Dakota Cattlemen, and the South Dakota Conservation Districts all went together and formed a land trust. There's 12 of us that are in production agriculture that are on the board of directors. We decided if anybody's going to hold these easements, we wanted it to be a board that's controlled by farmers and ranchers. And so we formed that, and we're uh, just in the process of getting our 501c3, which is a nonprofit. So people like Daryl that got a lot of money, if they want to give us a couple million to buy an easement or two, he can write it off. And so, uh, anyway, uh, we've launched that, and uh, I've offered, actually, I think I, I said something to Daryl, I'd probably send him, and uh, I don't know if who, somebody else, just a one-pager to tell you, just to give you a little idea what this is all about. We'll never own land. All we're going to hold is the easement to it. And the easements might be written just a little bit different than U.S. Fish and Wildlife. But w the whole idea behind them not necessarily to protect wetlands, not necessarily to protect grasslands, but to protect production agriculture. Because urbanization in parts of our state is a problem. We've got people that are coming, for example, into the Black Hills region, and that's where there's a lot of popularity in this, and they're buying a section of land and dividing it into 10-acre lots and reselling it. And all at once, it's a problem, especially for those people that neighbor it. And so urbanization is a problem, and it's, especially if you move west from here. Uh, we're, we'll be part of what's called a partnership for range trusts, which is the western states that do this. But, you know, people moving from the big cities out to rural America and subdividing it is a problem for production agriculture. And so we're hoping that we can provide something that's been needed in our state uh, in forming the land trust. So that's kind of a long answer, but thank you for that in. Other questions? Uh, I have one more. Do you fill that hole in the tire just with an auger then? Um, yeah, he's, what he's got is he's got a, you can buy them at auction sales, pretty cheap. We all used to have four inch augers. So what did you use a four inch auger for? Well, the four inch augers really came became very popular when Daryl and Lyle got old enough not to shovel into the, into the grinder anymore. Then our dads bought four-inch augers. Right, Daryl? 
Yeah. Anyway, that's what he fills it with. He's got a little four-inch auger that's on wheels, and uh, he just backs up to it and, and fills the hole. But yeah, that's, that's how, it gets, how it gets filled. Yep. Any other questions or comments for Lyle? All right. Go, oh, Ron. How did the partnership with McDonald's form that three-year relationship? Well, McDonald's has had a, um, the, a program, flagship farmers program, um, in Europe. And they launched it in the United States probably about a year and a half ago. And we had to fill out an application. And at times since we filled the application out, we questioned whether we should have, just because uh, it's pretty time consuming, not only to fill the application out, but sometimes it's good if people ask you about five pages of questions so you can put some things in paper, some things in paper that help you formulate, yeah, okay, what is the answer to that question? So that part of it is good, but then they come with a film crew, and, and that, they did that this June. Uh, but what it does is it gives us a platform for a company like McDonald's. They serve 69 million meals a day. They're the biggest consumer of meat that we produce. Over 95% of the meat that they serve in America is, is meat that comes from us, not imported. And it gives us a position at the table. So when they decide in Canada that they're going to partner with Beyond Meats, anybody know who Beyond Meats is? Okay, they're, our, they're the new protein source that a lot of the fast foods are looking at putting on the menu. And uh, I have no problem competing with protein, other protein sources, be it chicken or pork or the veggie burger. Who in here has eaten a veggie burger besides me? Okay, a few of us have. One. One. That's all I'm going to eat. Anyway, it gives me or gives us a platform to tell McDonald's, listen, we don't mind you partnering with a plant-based product. A little disappointed, but don't mind you doing it. We don't like you partnering with a plant-based product that has a CEO that says, I want to put Daryl Oswald out of business. That's his goal. Wants to read because he believes that beef cattle um, are part of the climate problem we've got. So I can pick the phone up. As a matter of fact, they called me and told me that they were what they were doing in Canada as a pilot. And I said, okay, I'm disappointed, but okay. And then write them a letter that's kind of threatening and uh, about our disappointment and how we're reevaluating re our, our partnership, whether we should continue it. At the end of the day, we're going to stay with it. But it gives us a seat at the table and an invite to Ethan Brown from Beyond Meats. Why don't you come to our ranch and look at how we're raising our animals. And then, then maybe you can change what you're saying, because I don't mind you producing this product. But if you think that plowing up what we've got to produce the ingredients for your product is going to solve climate change. I'm going to show you that it isn't. And that's why it's important that we go to the table, sometimes with our adversaries, and try and explain to them why their messaging is wrong. Yes, sir. My understanding is it's only the provinces of Ontario and British Columbia that are going to be serving that. For now. Meat because uh, Tim Hortons has pulled out of Beyond Meat now because they have some such backlash from uh, Canadian beef producers. Who, who pulled out of it? Uh, Tim Hortons. Okay. Well, let's see, then the Canadian cattlemen, the, the, their approach to it is the same as mine, what I just said. And so don't kid yourself. If there's... You know, listen, the beef animal, the hamburger has been the cornerstone of their, of, of their product. It's what's made McDonald's what it is today. And so we're, we, were, we were pretty hard on them. But it's hard to be hard on them if you're not part of them. And the, the unfortunate part about it is I know the people that we deal with on a daily basis with McDonald's, they knew what we were going to say. But I also know who signs the front of their check. I mean, the, the, yeah, the front side of their check, so they got to be careful. But the, at, the, at the end of the day, it's important that we remain engaged with, those, with companies like McDonald's because uh, I've read some of, the, some of the books, and I know what corporate America deals with, the kind of pressure they deal with. I know why McDonald's doesn't have styrofoam containers anymore for serving their burgers. they got cardboard. I know why McDonald's sources their coffee 
and sources there. Why, 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 they, why there's uh, people that showed up in McDonald's restaurants demonstrating about chickens because McDonald's has a big stick. And why McDonald's wants to say our chickens are all cage free. So I, it's important that we remain engaged as much as possible with these big uh, corporations that serve the product that we depend on. Thank you.